Now let's take a few moments and look at where these brain structures are in case you're not familiar with them. We're looking here at the frontal cortex, which is huge. It is this entire front third of the human brain. But the area we are most interested in is right up front here, particularly on the right side, and especially where the frontal cortex sweeps down and under and then goes back and sits on a bone shelf just above the eyes. This is the orbital frontal cortex, and it's located, let me see if I can get this cursor back, right in here where you see that arrow. And this area of the brain projects up and back to the prefrontal lateral cortex up in here. The right frontal area of the brain is known as an inhibitory center. This is where the ability to suppress behavior and to keep it suppressed seems to originate. And that allows the rest of the frontal cortex, which is where the thinking takes place, where what we hold in mind is going on, it, to take over the guidance of behavior. But absent this inhibitory area, whatever you're holding in mind is of no consequence your behavior will be impulsive. Now, the next structure we're interested in, actually there are two here, there are projections from this part of the brain, in fact, all over the frontal cortex, back onto the basal ganglia, which is this structure. The basal ganglia is actually three separate structures. Whoops, and all of them are smaller in people with ADHD. But the one most important for our purposes is known as the striatum, which is the C-like structure. Again, let me bring up the cursor right here. This C-like structure that you see on the outside, and notice how thick it is at the front. And that's because as the frontal cortex evolved in humans and underwent a massive expansion over the course of primate evolution, the striatum had to follow suit and expand right along with it because this is where cells from the frontal lobe terminate. This is where what you think is going to guide what you do. But more importantly, as I will show later, it is likely that this striatum has become a switching system in humans. It determines whether what we think about becomes something we do or whether it simply stays private within the head as something we contemplate but don't execute. Somewhere, as we will see in the brain, there has got to be a switch that determines the public self from the private self. As Jacob Bronowski, the great polymath in Britain, who was the author of The Ascent of Man back in the 1970s, but an extraordinary scientist and mathematician, as he once said, humans are the only primate that have two selves. We have a public self which we show to others, and it is displayed in our external behavior, that which we release into the spinal cord and the peripheral skeletal system. But we also have a private self that other primates don't seem to have, at least not to the degree that we do. We engage in a series of actions in our mind, and we do not release those thoughts to the public. We have a private self and a public self. So somewhere there is a switch, and that switch is going to become increasingly important in trying to understand ADHD. Because what ADHD appears to be is a broken switching system probably something to do with this striatum, which therefore means that thinking is being expressed publicly. ADHD results in people thinking out loud. There is no private simulation of what one hopes to do. It is up, out, and done. So one way of thinking of ADHD as a broken switch in this public-private network Behavior we keep to ourself and do not show to others, and behavior that we elect to effortfully, willfully display. Somewhere there is a switch that distinguishes those two, and I think the best candidate is the basal ganglia. Why? Because when Tourette syndrome occurs, which is a gross disturbance in this structure, behaviors are released whether you want them to or not. Ticks, movements, thoughts, obscenities, compulsions, rituals, regardless of what the individual wishes to do, cannot suppress these behaviors, and they will become public. And that is because the system is broken at a very deep level of the basal ganglia, and they cannot suppress them anymore. 
Now, the next structure we are interested in is also up in the frontal lobe, and it is between the two hemispheres. And it's located right about where that arrow is located, but you can't see it because it's on the walls between the two hemispheres. And this is the anterior cingulate, about which I will have much more to say in a moment. And then as we look toward the back part of the brain, that very old brain, the primitive brain, is the cerebellum. And it is mainly in this area of the cerebellum that we see under development. Now, that's rather interesting because studies now have shown that family members of people who have ADHD, ADHD was in my family, that when we look at the parents and at the siblings of people with ADHD, we also see underdevelopment in most of these regions, but not in all of them. Which means that this underdevelopment is part of the family phenotype of ADHD. ADHD is a spectrum disorder, and biological relatives of affected patients do show some symptoms of ADHD, but not the full disorder. This is very much like autistic spectrum disorders in that sense, where we see elements of autistic-like symptoms, but not full disorder or diagnosable disorder in those individuals. What has been fascinating has been the work of the UCLA research team, Jim McGough, Jim McCracken, and others, that have shown that when we look at the relatives of people with ADHD, the frontal lobe, the anterior cingulate, the basal ganglia are also smaller, even though the people don't have the disorder. The difference is the cerebellum. The affected patients have the underdevelopment in the cerebellum. The non-affected family members do not suggesting that the cerebellum may actually be the most crucial structure in explaining why the disorder rises to full disorder, penetrating the phenotype and becoming diagnosable ADHD. Now, that research needs to be replicated, but a similar finding has recently been published in the field of autism, where, again, family members show autistic-like symptoms, but full disorder seems to have something to do with the involvement of the cerebellum. So this isn't the only disorder in which the cerebellum has become more and more important 